Okay, well, this morning, we're just going to look at the uh, first five verses of Galatians 6, and <clears throat> we'll find that it has plenty of things uh, to tell us, and things that are very helpful. Uh, all that the Word of God has to say is helpful, but I think, you know, maybe some areas are maybe more helpful than others, especially if we happen to be tempted to falter in this area. Uh, and this is an area we all have difficulty with, especially if we understand what it is that Paul's actually saying here. He's not saying we shouldn't bear one another's burdens when, you know, we're going through difficult times. Uh, but that is addressed in other parts of Scripture. I think he means primarily bearing with one another in our faults, in our weaknesses, in our sins, and how we are to do that. So let's look at it that way. And, and I am going to touch on both aspects, just um, perhaps that first one a little bit more briefly. But Paul writes this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another, for each one will bear his own load. Now, again, as I read that, I'm very conscious of the fact that if you really try to wrap your mind around what Paul is saying at any given time, pretty much in most of his epistles, again, we agree with Peter that he writes things that are difficult to understand. And, you know, there's some things in here that we, we can understand quite readily, and, and the, but the, the hard part is how do all these pieces fit together? Is he talking about the same thing throughout here? Why does he say, bear one another's burdens, and then he tells us that each of us has to bear his own burden? So, okay, we want to try to make sense of this, but as we do, I think it, it's helpful to see where we've just come from in, in Galatians chapter 5. Now, remember last week, Paul gave us a further contrast. He's contrasting the way of the Judaizers and the way of Christ. You know, and again, the Judaizers is you earn your own righteousness, your own justification by keeping the law, you know, salvation by works. And of course, the way of Christ is trusting in him alone and in his works and not yours at all, period. Now, Paul already gave us this contrast that if you follow the way of the Judaizers, that's the way of death. You know, you, you won't be saved. And of course, trusting Christ, you will live. That, that's a very... Um, a very strong contrast, but now he's pointing out another contrast, and that is the practical results of following the Judaizers or trusting in Christ. He says, if we go the way of the Judaizers, at least we saw this last week, if we rely on our own righteousness that we earn through the law, it will strengthen our flesh and make it impossible for us to obey. And the reason is this, because to turn to the law is to turn away from Christ, to turn away from His grace, to turn away from the grace of the Holy Spirit. And if we fall from Christ in this way, the only thing we have left is what we have by nature, and that is the flesh. Now that, Paul said, is the reason why the Galatians had become arrogant. You know, they were becoming Pharisaical. And when you become a Pharisee and you begin to keep the law and you begin to deceive yourself into thinking you have kept it, then you begin looking down on other people and everybody's looking down on one another and condemning and biting, devouring one another. They, they turned on each other. That is the result of the Judaizer way of thinking, salvation through works. But to go the way of Christ, on the other hand, is to have the help of the Holy Spirit. I've been emphasizing that already. Remember, His work in our hearts to give us the ability to obey the law of God by giving us a love for love, a love for holy love, a love for the right kind of love. Uh, and that's what God commands us to do. And that's why Paul encouraged the Galatians, why he encouraged us, walk by the Spirit. You know, yield to the Spirit. He's, he's giving us these holy inclinations. He's given us the Word. 
And He's giving us the desire to go that way, to go the way of holiness, to go the way of love, yield to Him. He says if we do that, we will not yield to the flesh. We will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Now, He is saying not only would this end their prideful squabblings amongst themselves, it would help them and it would help us to do what He next calls us to do which is to bear with one another or to bear each other's burdens. Now, Paul, first of all, tells us in our text, if we walk by the Spirit, this is what we will do. We will bear the burdens that we cause each other by our sins because some of these sins, you know, are actually offenses against one another. And when we're offended by someone, that creates a burden, especially the burden of having to deal with that, you know, and having to help restore that person, not to mention the, you know, the pain you feel from that, that wound. But if we walk by the Spirit, we can bear that, and He will also help us to seek to restore that person patiently and gently. And I believe that's what Paul has in mind where he writes in verses 1 and 2 of Galatians 6, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. I don't think Paul is saying two things there. I think he's saying one. If somebody is caught in a trespass, maybe they sinned against you. Restore them. Bear this burden. Christ wants you to love them. Now, let's, let's consider, first of all, what it is that Paul means when he says, if they're caught in a trespass, okay? What, what kinds of sins are we supposed to be seeking to restore one another from? Well, obviously, he's not talking about the sins of the mind and the sins of the heart because those are invisible and we obviously can't see those, but God can see them, right? And God will deal with them in His way, in His timing, and in His love, you know, if, if we are believers, but what Paul is talking about are the two kinds of sins that we can see. And I think we can divide them into two different categories, those that have to do with belief and those that have to do with practice, what we call doctrinal and moral issues. Now, let me say something that perhaps we don't like to think about and maybe won't even agree with, but it's true of all of us. We all have problems in our belief system. Okay, we all have problems with our doctrine. There are so many beliefs in the Christian church, so many that fall under the rubric of historic Christianity, and many of them that contradict each other, right? They can't all be true. Many of these beliefs are actually wrong, and any error in belief will hurt us in some way. Now, let me just say at the outset, we do need to help one another in these areas, but again, because there's so many disagreements, we have to be careful how we do this, don't we? This is an in-house discussion when we're talking about, you know, a number of these things, you know, these lesser errors. We need to deal with these through friendly discussion, through debate, let's search the scriptures together, let's come to a conclusion, okay? So what I'm saying is we don't have to jump on everybody for everything we see they might disagree with, with us on. But there are things that we do need to deal with, okay? Those are the more serious errors, and those are the errors that strike at the heart of the gospel. And let me just mention them briefly, such as rejecting the Bible as the Word of God, okay? We can't do that and be a Christian. Rejecting the Trinity, rejecting the deity of Christ, rejecting His humanity, rejecting the virgin birth, His messiahship rejecting the Spirit's personality and His deity, rejecting the idea that we're fallen and under condemnation and that we need salvation. And of course, the one that Paul's been dealing with, that justification is by grace through faith alone. If we reject that, or we reject the idea that if we are truly justified, we will be being transformed into the image of Christ, that sanctification has to follow justification, okay? Those errors are, are much more serious. Those are the kinds of errors that can destroy us, okay? And that's why we must 
address them. Yeah, that's what Paul's doing in this letter, remember? The Judaizers are pointing to a wrong way of salvation. And he's saying, if you follow them, you're going to be destroyed. You know, and then he has some choice things to say about them as well, that they might be cut off from God's covenant. So we need to address those things, doctrinal issues that strike at the heart of the gospel. But there are also other types of sins that we're more familiar with, and those are the ones that fall into the category of moral, you know, sins of practice, the breaking of God's commandments. Remember what's behind the commandments I've been emphasizing, which is love. Whenever we fail to love, we're actually sinning. Remember the great commandment, which is to love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength? Well, we break that commandment when we don't make God the center of our lives, when He's not our priority, when we don't worship Him or worship Him in the way that He commands us, when we don't keep our promises to Him, the vows that we have made, and when we don't keep His Sabbath day holy. That's a part of the Ten Commandments as well. But the Lord tells us we are not only to love God and put Him first in our lives, they also tell us that we are to love our neighbors ourselves. And this is the part that Paul is emphasizing this morning. We break that commandment when we don't respect authority, when we don't protect each other's well-being, when we don't protect each other's sexual purity or possessions or reputations. Okay, now again, that was a quick summary of the Ten Commandments, and let's not forget those are the Ten Commandments on how to love. Now, these are all serious matters. At best, and there's no really no best here, but at best they wound the soul by grieving the Holy Spirit. But we need to remember at worst, if we practice these things, and by practice I mean we don't fight against it, we just simply do it, and we're not struggling at all. We just give ourselves to it, knowing that God tells us it's wrong, or we don't do something that we know He tells us is right, and we just will not do it. John tells us, and again, in 1 John, as we looked a little bit earlier, that we don't know God. Yeah? We, if we hate our brother, we don't know God. That was one thing. But now listen to what he writes here in 1 John 3, verses 9 through 10. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. You know, this is one of the reasons why a lot of Christians don't read 1 John. It is very convicting. But it does remind us that if we are born again of God, the Spirit of God will be doing a work, and this is what that work looks like, okay? The practice of righteousness. That means practicing the law of God out of thankfulness, not to save ourselves, not legalistically, but out of love for God because He has loved us. We want to love Him in return and love our neighbor as ourselves or more specifically as Christ has loved his neighbor because he did it perfectly. Now, so that we don't get the impression that Paul is calling us to do here, what he has just condemned in the Judaizers and the Galatians for following them, that is becoming arrogant, you know, thinking we've got it all made and everybody else doesn't, you know, thinking better of ourselves than we ought to think, and so we turn on one another, trying to correct one another in absolutely every area. Paul says that there are certain things that have to be true of us before we would attempt to restore anyone in any particular fault or sin. He says we need to be spiritual. He says that in, um, was it verse, well, verse 1, you who are spiritual, okay, restore such a one. Now, what he means by this is that you need to be walking in the Spirit. I need to be walking in the Spirit to the degree that Christ's image is being formed in us, that we are being, again, transformed into His likeness and His character. Now, that will help us in many different ways. First of all, if we're spiritual, if we're walking in the Spirit, we will be practicing 
righteousness, okay, we'll be doing the things we should be doing and the things that we're supposed to be helping our brothers and sisters also to do. We'll be believing the truth. We'll be practicing love. We'll be loving others, even though we'll be doing it imperfectly. So that when we reach out to restore each other, we won't be perceived as being hypocritical, right? I mean, think about the consequences of that. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verses 3 through 5. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. What Jesus is telling us is, is this, that if we attempt to correct each other while we are doing the same thing, or maybe something even worse, we're not going to be very effective, are we? We're more likely going to offend because we're being hypocritical. Why are you coming to me when you've got this problem kind of thing? But if, by His grace, we seek to restore each other in areas where, again, we have been able to put on Christ, either overcome a sin or put on righteousness, I think our efforts are going to be much more welcome, aren't they? We don't want to be corrected by somebody worse than us, but somebody who has some success in that area. Okay, so that's one thing. You know, walking by the Spirit, we're going to be obeying and we're going to be more useful and helpful because we'll be an example of what it is we're trying to help the others, our brothers and sisters in. Secondly, if we're spiritual, we'll also be filled with love, the love of the Holy Spirit. And that will give us the ability to approach each other in gentleness. Remember, he says we need to do this in a spirit of gentleness. That is a fruit of the Spirit. That is one of the, the many ways that the Spirit's love that He produces in our hearts expresses itself through us towards others. When we come to somebody to correct them and we're harsh, we're just going to drive them further away, right? But if we are gentle, if we're patient, then others are going to be more apt to listen to us. You know, it reminds me of... Um, you know, what the, what's said in the Proverbs, how, you know, a harsh answer stirs up wrath, but a gentle answer turns it away, right? Somebody comes up to you and they're angry and you respond in anger, it's just going to, you know, aggravate things, it's just going to make it worse. But if you speak calmly and peacefully and gently, it tends to calm other people down. Well, same thing happens here. Even if there isn't an argument, this gentleness, it adds a kind of sweetness to the corrective medicine that we need to give them. Now thirdly, and this is perhaps the thing he emphasizes the most, and really the last point, if we're walking by the Spirit, we will be humbled, okay? Paul's emphatic about this particular qualification. He says in verse 1, looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted, okay, we'll look at that in just a moment, but then I believe verses 3 through 5, he's expanding on that same theme. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, okay, looking to yourself, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another, for each one will bear his own load. I think what Paul is telling us here is this, that if we are to find the kind of gentleness the kind of patience, the kind of humility that we need in order to help each other, we first need to take a good look at ourselves, okay? We need to be humbled, okay? We need to recognize we are weak, our own weaknesses, our own vulnerabilities. The Bible says we're only fooling ourselves if we think we don't have any. You know, there are people in this world who profess to be Christians. You ever heard of perfectionists? They believe that they've become perfect. You know, they reach a stage of spirituality where they no longer sin. Well, that's impossible, especially in light of what John says in 1 John 1, 8. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
But then he goes on to say, if we confess our sins, acknowledge them. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Paul says we need to take a good look at ourselves, take a close look at ourselves, examine what it is that we have done, how we have lived, what's going on in our hearts and in our thoughts. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, we'll find that we really have no reason to boast. You know, it almost sounds like he's implying we might find some reason to boast, but there really is no reason to boast in ourselves. Our only boasting, as Paul said, is in the Lord Jesus Christ, what he has done, his cross, his righteousness. Perhaps Paul has in mind here, examine yourself and see what, what Christ has done in you and be thankful. You know, that's something we can glory in, what Christ is doing in us, because that's his work, and it's not our work. But what he is saying here really emphatically is this, what we should not do is compare ourselves with others or with each other, okay? That's what the Judaizers were doing. That's what they were encouraging the Galatians to do. That's why they were becoming proud and they were attacking each other. It's because they thought better of themselves than they really sh should have. But if we examine ourselves carefully and we see our own imperfections, we sense the burden that it creates in our own hearts. What happens when you take a good look at yourself and you see what you're really like? You know, as James says, take a look at the law. It's like a mirror. And look at your face. It shows you everything about your face you don't want to see, right? What does that do? Well, there's one of two things that can happen. You can either walk away and forget what you just saw, and that happens a lot, doesn't it? Or we can take a good look at it and let it humble us. When we become aware of our imperfections, our sins, our weaknesses, it makes us humble. And when we're humble, we are better able to help others, okay, our brothers and sisters with their particular sins. We're able better to bear their burdens. So knowing that we are liable ourselves to fall into the same sins or similar sins should give us sympathy. Okay, sympathy literally means to suffer along with someone else. You can kind of enter into their sufferings because you've gone through it. That's very, very helpful. Remember what the author to the Hebrews wrote about Jesus himself, that the Son of God became a man, and he became a man to die, but he also became a man for another reason, to experience what we go through in this world so that he could sympathize with us, so that he could know what we're going through, so that as our high priest, he might better pray for us. Listen to what the author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. That's the reason why the high priest always had to be a human being, okay? Because a human being is aware of the weaknesses of men because he's a man and he knows how to pray, he knows how to deal, he knows how to help. So we are to draw on our own experiences with sin, temptation and the like, so that we can sympathize with and help each other. By the way, I should mention, not like Job's friends, okay? If you've been reading the book of Job, you found that these three friends didn't do a very good job of this. As a matter of fact, they, they kind of came with Job. They sat down for several days, and none of them said anything because they wanted Job to speak first, and Job did speak first. And when he did, they jumped on him, started accusing him of sin. You, you're suffering... You must have sinned against God because if you were obeying, God would be blessing you. And that was their wrong worldview. Now, that does happen. But there are other dimensions to our suffering besides that we've sinned. I mean, Christians die. Christians get sick. Christians go through difficult times. And God loves his people. He's not punishing them for some sin that they've committed. Sometimes he does discipline us for sins. But as I said before, his discipline... Is always meant to teach us something. It's not necessarily in response to a sin, but it's in some way the Lord is teaching us to become more like Jesus Christ. We know that happens. There are other reasons. So again, from our own experiences, we draw upon those things to help us sympathize with, become humble, come in gentleness, and in love to help 
one another. Now, I, I told you that that is what I think is the burden of what Paul is saying here, but let's not forget that we are to bear each other's burdens in other areas as well, right? Paul says we are to weep with those who weep. When one of us is experiencing suffering or loss, we need to enter into one another's suffering and bring comfort, the kind of comfort we experienced when we were going through the same thing, you know, from the Lord, from His Word, from, from other believers. We need to comfort others as well. And then John tells us that we are to bear each other's material burdens, he says in 1 John 3, 17 through 18. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Notice, you know, don't just think it, don't just feel it, don't just say it, but do it, okay? Now, what John here is, he's not telling us that we are to enable others not to work if, if their situation has come about because they refuse to work, you know, we need to reprove them and get them to work. That's what we need to do. But he's talking about our brethren who can't help themselves, right? They're not able to work. We are to do what we can to relieve their suffering, what we are able to do to relieve their suffering. Paul says that when we do this, okay, when we bear one another's burdens in either of these two ways, we thereby fulfill the law of Christ, that law being, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, bearing each other's burden is something we'd never be able to do apart from Christ. Remember, Paul is contrasting the, Ju the way of the Judaizers with the way of the gospel. This is where the Judaizers failed because they were relying on their flesh. They weren't bearing one another's burdens. They were intensifying the rift that the sins were, being, were causing by becoming proud and attacking them. So how do we find the strength to be able to uh, bear this burden as we should? Well, again, this is something we can only do by walking in the Spirit. And we need to remember that this is why the Lord has given us the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not so that we might experience various things. I mean, He does want us to experience joy, you know, and peace and things of that nature, contentment, okay, those are things we should experience that are subjective. But He gave us the Spirit to fulfill the law of God in us, to give us the ability to do it. And that ability that He gives us is really the desire to do it. The only reason why people break the law of God is because they don't want to do it. You know, they, they have sin in their hearts and they rebel against it. But if you have a heart that's changed, that's inclined towards it, it, it's not difficult. It's not a burden. It's actually what you want to do. But again, that is why He gave us the Spirit. So let me close again with that reminder from Romans 8, verses 3 through 4, what Paul writes, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh. Think about, again, the way of the Judaizers. God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And let me just say, he's not talking here about imputed righteousness. He's not talking about the righteousness that comes to us by trusting in Christ by which we are justified. He is talking about the grace of the Holy Spirit by which we are sanctified. If we walk by the Holy Spirit, He will fulfill the requirement of the law in us. He will give us the desire to obey, and we will obey. And we will do all that the Lord calls us to do, though imperfectly. We will strive to do it better and better because we love the Lord. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in just a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, let's ask the Lord to help us walk in the Spirit and put on these characteristics and be better equipped to help one another in these areas. And, and let's also pray He would prepare us to come to the, the Lord's table this morning.